Right, so let's go ahead and look at the uh, next pair of photographs that I have. Now here's another scene looking out of a window. In this case though, that the contrast is much higher. The aperture again is f8, the ISO is at base levels at 100. And in this case, the shutter speed is faster at 250th because the brightness coming in from the outside window is much higher, in this case, the skylight. And so in order to expose for that properly and keep that just below clipping, the shadow areas around the window are now much deeper than the shadows were on that photograph we just looked at, which means I'm now going to have to elevate the shadows even higher than the amount that I elevated them in that first photograph. All right, so here are the photographs after elevating the exposure. What I've done again is increase the fill light to 100%, which is equal roughly to about five or six stops of light. And then on top of that, I've actually increased the broad or total exposure by two additional stops. And so the total shadow push here is about seven or eight stops. So we're reaching into the very deepest of shadows where you can reasonably expect to get any kind of a natural color and detail rendition. And then also what I've done is lower the exposure of that outside window by two stops to compensate for the two stops of exposure, a positive adjustment I've done for the entire image. And so you can see here zoomed out that the Canon image is much worse even than the Canon image of the previous photographs. The pattern, the cross-hatching pattern is much more apparent. The color noise is much more apparent, even at this zoomed out magnification. Now, if I look and zoom in, you can see that the Canon image is now descended completely into noise where even outside of the banding issue, we've far exceeded the shadow capability of the Canon where we've reached deep into the shadows and produced only noise. And so there's hardly any detail that's surviving here. And the only detail you really see is this false detail that's being produced as a result of the banding. And you can also see here as well that the color has completely fallen apart. There's blotchiness. There's none of the original tonal rendition of the color of the original scene. Again, just descended into random areas of red, green, and blue. Now, what you see on the left is the Nikon. And so in the very deepest of shadows for the Nikon, I'm also starting to exceed the, what I would consider acceptable amount of noise and loss of color fidelity within the image. You can see here, there's also some blotchiness within the Nikon, at least much more than we saw in the previous Nikon photo. Again, because we've had to elevate the exposure even more. And here you can actually see a stuck pixel. And so this is at the very deepest end of the shadows where uh, here at the very darkest, where on the right you see the Canon, just it's imperceptible what even was there originally. You can still see detail within the uh, Nikon image, but again, there's a lot of noise here and a lot of loss of that color rendition. This is a situation where even for the Nikon body, you can say that the amount of stops that I've pushed the shadows maybe has started to exceed what the, the sensor is really capable of and still producing a, a workable photograph. But again, this is at 100% magnification, so we still have the ability to introduce some noise reduction to see if we can at least smooth out some of that noise to make it workable, particularly if you're going to downsample this image into a print like an 8x10 print or a print that's smaller. So I'll go ahead and zoom into the Nikon image and we'll start to uh, apply some noise reduction. So you can see here, aside from the blotchiness, there's a lot more of this random noise, again, because we've elevated the shadows even higher. So I'll go ahead and start increasing the luminance noise reduction. In this case, I know I'm going to have to increase it more than the previous photograph. And so here I've increased it to about 32, which has uh, sort of eliminated that salt and pepper luminance noise that I see, but it hasn't done anything for the, the color noise because I'm only altering the noise reduction within the luminance channel. And so I'll see if I can eliminate some of that blotchiness with increasing the color noise reduction. And while I increase it, you may not be able to see it in the video, but there's a slight improvement in the blotchiness. But really, the blotchiness is still there. And so the color fidelity within the image is gone, at least for these deepest shadows. And so this is a case where either you would be forced to maybe not elevate the shadows as much, or maybe this is a candidate where, for instance, if you wanted to eliminate the appearance of that blotchiness, you can maybe uh, decide to convert this into a black and white photograph, in which case the blotchiness will show up more as a tonality blotchiness that sort of gradates between white and black, which is much more visible to the observer than the color blotchiness. And so as a black and white photograph, this can certainly work even at up to an 8x10 print, because again, the level of noise that I've been able to reduce is acceptable to me, and there's still an acceptable amount of detail. And now with the photograph being black and white, you don't have any of that blotchiness there that could otherwise ruin that photograph. So let's go ahead and try the same thing with the Canon photograph. So here we are in that same deep shadow. So let's go ahead and increase the luminous noise reduction to see at first if we can get rid of that cross-hatching pattern. And so on a previous photograph, I think we landed at around 70. So you can see here that around, at around that same point, 70, cross-hatching is still visible. It's, it's softened because you've softened it to match sort of the content of the background. But the blotchiness is completely unusable. So it now almost looks as if a child has colored crayons over the image where there's just no color fidelity whatsoever. And it almost looks like it's guessing as to what the rendition 
of the image data is. And it really is because the noise has completely overwhelmed uh, the signal levels within these deepest of shadows. And so by increasing this noise reduction to 70, I've not only destroyed the detail, but I really haven't done anything to offset this color noise. So I'll try here as well to increase the color noise reduction. And it's really not having much of an effect. There's a slight softening of the differences of the, the color gradations and the blotchiness, but even if I increase this all the way to 100, there's really nothing that's going to eliminate that noise. It's still almost as obvious as it was before, and even the banding is really still obvious here. So let me go ahead and try to do what I did with the 5100 image and convert this to a black and white, and I'll do that by sliding the saturation slider. And so you can see here, the, uh, the blotchiness is even more apparent compared to the black and white than the Nikon, because here there's much more variability in the gradation between the black and the white. And so I've improved it by eliminating the color from it, but it's still obvious. It, it almost looks like somebody took an ink blot against the image and create these random area distributions of luminance. And then what's also apparent is the cross-hatching pattern. So even with the noise reduction of the luminance all the way to 70, the pattern still remains. And so here zoomed at 100%, you can see the pattern is visible in this case, the photograph really isn't usable uh, from my point of view. I'll even try to increase the, uh, the luminance all the way up, noise reduction all the way up to 100%, and it really hasn't done much to the cross-hatching. It's still very uh, visible. There you can see at 100% magnification, I've completely destroyed any uh, semblance of detail within this photograph. The cross-hatching is much less visible at 100%, but then when you zoom out, the, the cross-hatching pattern is still very visible. So again, another demonstration of how in the real world the difference of dynamic range between the, the Sony sensor and the Nikon and the Canon sensor in the Canon has dramatic results as to how much of the, the shadow areas you can use and how much dynamic range you can represent in the final image. So here's the last pair of photographs. In this case, the exposure was a little bit brighter. The shutter speed was 1 100th. And again, I've exposed so that the highlight areas for the light coming through the window are exposed just below clipping which again has uh, underexposed the shadow areas within the image. So here are the images after post-processing where I've elevated the shadows. In this case, I've again increased the fill light to 100%, which is about five stops of light, and I've added a broad exposure adjustment of two stops, and then I offset that exposure for the original mid-tone and highlight areas by uh, reducing their exposure by two stops, so matching their original luminance to offset the elevated exposure I've done for the overall photograph. So again, this is another demonstration where the same kind of wall with the same type of texture, which is entirely overwhelmed by the cross-hatching pattern for the uh, Canon image, whereas on the Nikon image, it's just completely random noise, which is much more pleasing to the eye. And in this photograph, there's a bit more color within the image, and so it's a better demonstration of maybe how color would survive this extreme shadow pushing that I've done. And this is where potentially posterization could come into play. And so what you see here on the Nikon image, there's still a lot of color rendition, and the edge of this comfort here is pretty close to some of the lower or deeper shadows, and there's still a lot of that original tonal and color reproduction, in this case blue, which is typically one of the weaker of the three channels, and so that color rendition has been maintained. And now, just the same as on the other wall, you can see here that the noise for the Nikon image is pretty much completely random and pleasing and almost usable in its current form without any noise reduction, Whereas on the Canon image, you again have that cross-hatching pattern and you have that color blotching throughout the image. And here's some more colors represented. Here's some browns and some off-greens, which are showing you the, uh, the color reproduction. Here there's a, a bit more noise uh, visible within the Nikon image compared to the other areas which didn't have that color. And so you might want to apply some noise reduction here. And so this was, again, a comparison between the, the Nikon D5100 and the T2i, but really this is a comparison you can apply for most of the Nikon and Canon bodies. Uh, in particular, the 5100 shares the same sensor as the 7000, and the T2i, or the 550D, shares the same sensor as the newer T3i, as well as the original 7D, which was the first camera to use that Canon 18 megapixel sensor. And this is actually also comparable for the Canon 5D Mark II, which has a different sensor, but in my experience has similar levels of dynamic range and this cross-hatching pattern that you see on the 18 megapixel crop bodies. The 5D Mark II actually has a little bit less of that cross-hatching, so maybe you can squeeze out and be a third more stop, but it's not much of a difference when you compare it to the Nikon bodies, which have these 13 to 14 stops of usable dynamic range. I've made all six of these photographs available on my site. If you go into the description area underneath this video, there's a link to my site, which in turn has links to each of these photographs. 
both in their original form as well as in their post-process form. And then I also made an additional version of them available with the noise reduction added. That way you can see them at 100% magnification with their original rendition rather than trying to see those differences in a YouTube video you know, where sometimes even when you're looking at an HD video within YouTube, some of the compression adds artifacts and so you may not really see the true nature of the differences between all the photographs.